So I'm going to talk you through the botch arrow to do as a few of you were um, saying that you were a bit confused by it. Um, so the title is To Defy or Not To Defy, an experimental study of the dynamics of disobedience and whistleblowing. So in terms of the background, we had a look at the Milgram study. Um, it showed that you know when somebody was a legitimate authority figure, so they were actually a real authority figure, then people were more likely to obey them. Um, because in our culture, we have lots of authority figures, the police, um, fire people, um, doctors. They have legitimate authority, teachers, parents. Um, and so we obey them. Um, and that is kind of what Milgram study found also. But what Milgram study didn't look at was disobedience to unjust authority. So kind of an authority figure that, you know, it, it isn't legitimate, shouldn't be an authority figure, is just kind of posing as an authority figure and whether or not we'd, you know, disobey that authority figure or not. What the suggestion is, is that disobedience and defiance, so not going along with what other people tell you to do, if it's an unjust authority, is kind of what allows us to have social progress you know if you think of society that used to kind of be a kind of patriarchal society men were very much in charge of women um until the war happened and basically when women kind of took over um the roles of of the jobs of the men because they were away, away at war and then the men came back the women no longer carried on obeying kind of going along with you know, being a housewife and that kind of thing. They wanted their own independence and their own jobs. So by going against kind of what authority was saying, it allowed social progress and now women are on a more equal footing to men. So sometimes you kind of have to like disobey an authority figure because it allows progress in society. Now, we're not just looking at disobedience on its own. Uh, we're also having a look at whistleblowing. Now, whistleblowing is when you report wrongdoing to a higher authority. So, say you are working with somebody. So, you are, you have a job. I don't know, you work in Tesco's. Um, other supermarkets are available. Um, and, you know, the person isn't doing their job properly. If you were to go to your manager and tell them that the person wasn't working properly you would be whistleblowing or if you you know had a manager and they weren't doing a very good job and you went to their manager and you'd be whistleblowing on them so it's when you kind of report in wrongdoings to higher authorities now in more situations with defiant behaviors you'd anticipate kind of lower level of whistleblowing than disobedience because in order to whistleblow you have to have that confrontation with the authority figure you have to kind of um actually do something you have to go to somebody and say this is what's happening and that confrontation kind of puts people off so you'd kind of expect that if people weren't going along with it which is the easier option then they'll disobey which is the middle option rather than whistleblowing because that's um you know a bit more difficult to do so this study is to look at who are the people that disobey or blow the whistle? Is there something different about those people that disobey compared to the people that obey like Milgram found? Or, you know, is there something completely different about people who blow the whistle? You know, you might say that people who are a bit more outgoing um, are more likely to blow the whistle, whereas shy people, you know, maybe they'll just go along with it because they don't feel comfortable. Uh, we don't know this and this is the purpose of the study. We're also having a look, you know, why do they choose a challenging moral path? So the moral path is to whistleblow. You know, if someone's doing something wrong, the moral thing to do, the right thing to do is to um, tell somebody about it. So why do certain people do that? And why do other people just go along with it and, and not be moral? Even though, you know, they have morals, they're going against the morals because of the situation. So why are they doing that? And then, you know, are the personal characteristics that differentiate people from those that obey? You know, whether the participants in Milgram study are very different to other people and that's why they obeyed so much. So we're kind of having a look at, you know, is there something about different people that makes them more likely to disobey or to whistleblow? Um, because if we can find that out, then that might be quite useful as a practical application in society. So the aim of this study is to try and answer those questions. And also, um, it's kind of using the Milgram paradigm in the sense that You've got an authority figure requesting an immoral action of the participants. So in the Milgram study, the um, 
experimenter Jack Williams was asking the naive participant to give electric shocks to Mr Wallace in the other room every time he got a word pair wrong. It's an immoral action and the authority figure is requesting it. So this time Bocciaro is using that same kind of idea but a little bit differently. Um, This one's kind of giving them the chance to obey, to disobey or whistleblow against the immoral behaviour. So they've got kind of options. It's not like the, you know, there's no experimenters there saying you must continue. They've kind of got options of what they can do in this study. So it's basically aimed to uh, personally engage the participant in what's being done and to have mundane realism, to be kind of a realistic task that's something that they would kind of normally experience, it could actually happen in their everyday life, which means that any results we get from this study is kind of how they would normally behave, so how they would normally obey, disobey or whistleblow. It also needs to be ethical, you know, this is a contemporary study, Milgram's a classic study, the classic studies you know are always kind of getting away with being unethical modern research can't get away with that anymore. I'm not saying that's right to get away with it, said like I was saying that, but I'm not meaning that. Just in the sense that we have ethical guidelines now, we have an ethics board that we have to apply to for research, so this study has to be ethical because it's kind of a new one. Now a paradigm is kind of a model or a pattern for doing something. In science it kind of means a set of standardised procedures to manipulate behaviour and observe the consequences. Which, you know, if it's scientific, it means it's objective, it's, you know, a right or wrong answer, it's a number, uh, usually, which means that it's very replicable, which means that binds are more likely to be reliable. Um, in terms of the paradigm for this one, it's kind of just like how Milgram conducted it with an authority figure that the same is going to be done in this one, so you can have a standardised procedure to follow, uh, it's going to be quite... Uh, objective and reliable because it's replicable, things like that. So we've got some hypotheses. These are predictions that Bocciaro has made before the suit takes place. So these are what he thinks he's going to find. So he's suggesting participants will be more obedient than those in Milgram because they're not being asked to do anything physically aggressive. So it's not like they're going to feel as morally uncomfortable as they probably did in Milgram's study. So there's going to be some different levels of obedience. He's suggesting that participants will be less likely to whistleblow than obey because that whistleblowing means that direct contact with somebody. It's quite uncomfortable to do that. So he's predicting a lower level um, of whistleblowing than obedience. He's suggesting that participants will overestimate the tendency to disobey or blow the whistle because he's going to ask people to predict what they think they will find in terms of whistleblowing and disobedience. And he thinks that they're going to have a higher estimate than what's actually found. And then the fourth one is going to be that Personality characteristics will not have much effect on whether a person obeys, disobeys or whistleblows. Because remember, this is a social approach study. If a social approach believes in situational explanations for behaviour, they don't believe in dispositional explanations for behaviour. So things like your personality characteristics is a dispositional factor. That's an individual difference about you. So Bocciaro suggested that actually that's not going to have an influence on it because the social approach to situation is more powerful than your dispositional factors. Is suggesting that your behaviour is determined by the situation and environment that you're in. So the method that's been used, there's no actual independent variable like the Milgram study. So it's a controlled observation. Uh, it's controlled because it's in a laboratory setting, but it's not a lab experiment because you haven't got an IV. Your DV though, the thing that's being measured, is obedience, disobedience and whistleblowing, so the level of those. Now you've got the study taking place in a laboratory at the VU University in Amsterdam. So it's all set up like a laboratory, it's all controlled and standardised, but there's no IV, so it's not a lab experiment, it's a controlled observation. Uh, you've got lots of high control because you've got the experimenter, who's the authority figure, um, and the cover story that was used are all consistent, so for every participant they're exactly the same and they've got two specially prepared rooms that have been used um, because obviously they, they're in one room and they get taken to another um, and the timings and all of that kind of stuff is all exactly the same so the whole procedure standardised which means that you can replicate it and then you can check to see if you've got consistent results and if you have then you can say that the results are reliable. Sample, 
We've got 149 Dutch undergraduate students. Now, undergraduate means uh, like the first degree that you do. So when you leave college and you go to university, your undergraduate is your first degree. Because when you graduate, then you become a postgraduate and it's after graduation. So undergraduate is before you graduate. So for those three years or four years, if you've gone a, um, a course with a placement or a language course or whatever. Um, and they've got 96 women and 53 men. So we've got quite... I don't know, I said that wrong then, but we've got more women than we've got men. So maybe, you know, we've got quite a, a bias in the sample there, but not, I mean, it's like 60, 100. Mm, yeah, we've got more women, basically, so maybe that's going to have an impact. Mean age is 20.8, um, and we've got standard deviation there at 2.65, so it's not too far away from the mean. They're quite clustered around that 20.8. But then you might say that maybe these fines are only applicable to people who are that age, you know, undergraduate students who are at a different time of life than everybody else and how they obey and disobey and whistleblow might be completely different. You know, might, maybe they won't be as confident in themselves as they are as people to be able to whistleblow as what somebody older might be, when you know, a bit more experienced in life. Um, or maybe they'll be even more confident because they're, they're kind of, you know, experiencing new things all the time. Maybe there's something different about them which might affect the results. Now they're getting seven euros or course credit. So course credit is like where you, um, you like get a pass for for so many kind of, uh, you know, they, they basically add up all your marks in university and you get an overall score at the end. So if you get course credits, you're basically getting like uh, stuff for free in terms of being able to pass your course. So it's good to have course credits. So you know these these participants are going to kind of get benefit from. Um, taking part in this research but you might say that that might re like remove their right to withdraw because they're gonna maybe feel like they're, they're obliged to take part because they want those course credits or because they need the money so maybe that will have an impact on how they behave in your study maybe we won't get ecologically valid results of how they behave in kind of everyday life now it's a self-selected also known as a volunteer sample so you know they've they're volunteering to take part in exchange for that seven euros or for the course credit so you might say they'll take it more seriously because uh, they wanted to do it you know the, the sample's probably less likely to suffer from attrition uh, participants drop it out so you're not going to have kind of like a bias sample but then maybe we have got a bias sample because we've only got people who volunteered maybe people who go out of their way to volunteer are the ones that are more outgoing and would whistleblow or maybe they're the more obedient ones maybe that's why we have a high level of obedience in this study who knows we don't actually know what impact that would have on our sample We've got a total of 11 participants removed from the initial sample of 160 because of their suspiciousness about the nature of the study. So they were kind of showing demand characteristics. They're kind of getting a bit suspicious about what it, what it is. Um, and so that doesn't bias the sample. They've been removed. But then you might say, is that a good thing to remove them? Because by moving, removing them from the study, like, is that not going to bias the sample anyway? Because maybe they're the ones that might whistleblow. Because they're a bit more suspicious than you know maybe suspiciousness is a is a personal characteristic which affects whether you are obedient disobedient or whistleblowing we don't know so the sample's not great but then it is quite big i mean you've got 149 that's quite a, a large number that is quite good in that sense uh, but then it's dutch so it's quite ethnocentric uh, you know maybe we can't explain you know the obedience disobedience and whistleblowing of other people in other countries uh, they did some pilot tests. So pilot tests are kind of like a test run to see whether or not what you're about to do is going to work or not. So it's usually on a, a smaller scale. Um, so as you can see, it is small. There's 92 students for this one. They're still from Amsterdam. And these took part prior to the main study to check that the procedure was believable. So things that they were being asked to do in the main study, was it believable? Because if not, they would have changed it. Because remember, we want to have mundanely realistic tasks so that we get, you know, good results, valid, ecologically valid results. Making sure that the procedure is morally acceptable so that they're OK. They think that it's, you know, all right to go along because we don't want a repeat of Milgram's study with it being immoral because of all the ethical issues with that. Um, to make sure that the behaviour of the experimental authority figure was standardised. So they're having a bit of a practice run, really, with this pilot to make sure that they've been, you know, behaving in the same way so that they don't behave one way with one participant and another way with another participant because that could impact on whether they're obedient or disobedient or whistleblower. Um, and the pilot participants judged the procedure to be believable, 
morally acceptable and good qualitative data that are cool and interesting, good for science. So they were totally fine with the experiment, which suggest well, is it an experiment? It's controlled observations because of no IV. So they're completely okay with um the way that it's been done. And the pilot tests were necessary for the university institutional review board to approve the project design. So it's like they're saying that they're doing a, um, a study that's morally acceptable and, and it's all good and all that kind of stuff, but they need to have this pilot to prove that. So this pilot's like they're approved to allow them to do the main scale study to find out all the things that Bochara wants to find out. So prior informed consent, which consisted of information about the tasks required, any risks involved, the right to withdraw and the confidentiality uh, was basically told to the participants. So, I mean, they weren't told kind of the thing that they were doing because there's a little bit of deception involved, which we'll come to in a minute, but they've, they're basically being told exactly what they have to do in the experiment um, and any risks and they can leave when they want and everything's private because it's confidential. So you can say it's very ethical in that sense. We've got some comparison students. So as well as pilot test from before to so the test room, we've also got 138 comparison students. Now these are just to compare the predictions to how they actually behaved in this main study. So this happened before the actual study happened. So these um, students were asked a survey to predict how people would behave. They were given a detailed description of the study, of, of everything that they had to do in the same way that the participants um, were told what was going to happen. And they were asked to predict what they would they think the average student would do. Then part of the actual main study, we've got a research committee ethics form, which is basically, you know, outlining um, the ethical nature of, of the um, study that's being done. We've got two personality tests. So we've got the hexaco PIR, which is to assess the personality traits of the participants on these kind of uh, traits. We've got honesty and humility, emotionality, extroversion, so how outgoing you are, agreeableness, so how much will you go along with things, conscientiousness, so how hard working you are, and openness to experience. We've got 60 statements on the test. This is a psychometric measure, um, and they're having to indicate on a Likert scale um, how they agree, so at the bottom there you see the Likert scale. Oh, no, I've said it there, there you go. <laughs> Uh, this is the copy of the research committee form that they were shown. So it says the free university aims to promote excellent and ethical research. All research should strive to minimise the risk to participants so they will not be exposed to any more risks than they would encounter in their usual lifestyle. More in detail, participants should be protected from psychological harm, anxiety, stress, embarrassment, humiliation. Researchers should inform participants if they see signs of physical problem that these latter are unaware of and if you think the research on sensory deprivation violates the above mentioned basic ethical norms please report this to the human ethics committee by checking in the box below um, and putting it in the mailbox so basically when they've been given the description of the study on sensory deprivation they're asked to fill in this form and they check the box if they think that it is um, unethical now if they check that box they are basically disobeying because the, the experiment has actually told them to uh, say that it's ethical even though it's not. Let's see if this is on here. We've got also the second uh, measure of the participants is the decomposed game measure. Now this is a nine item test that assesses how much importance a person placed on the welfare of others. So it might be kind of like somebody will say um, if you um let's just say you kind of it creates like a dilemma a decision that you've got to make so it might kind of be like um you know like deal or is it deal or no deal when they decide oh it's not deal or no deal there's a thing where you can it's like shaft or or deal and you basically like if the other person says um, they're going to um, shaft you, then and the other person says shaft as well, you both go away with nothing. But if one of you says shaft and the other one says share, 
then the person who says shaft gets all the money. Whereas if you both say share, you get half each. So it's kind of like um, a dilemma like that to see whether or not you'll share or whether you'll just shaft the other person. So it's kind of a nine item test on that and it's kind of got a picture like that looks a bit like that. Um, oh, this is it here. Oh, I should have probably shown this before. Uh, so participants are asked to imagine that they have been randomly paired with another person called the other person. So the other is not someone you will know or ever meet. So you're never going to meet them again. You don't know them. Because um, you might think if they did know them, then that might influence your decision. And choices produce points for you and points for the other. So in this example, if you choose A, you would receive 500 points and the other person would receive 100 points. For each of the nine tests, circle A, B or C, depending on which you prefer. So if it's B, you both get half each. And if it's C, you get more than the other person. So it's testing to see whether, you know, people who maybe select B, maybe they're more obedient because they're nicer to other people, so they go along with it. Maybe the whistleblowers would be the C's because they get more, or maybe the A's. Who knows? We're trying to see if there's any differences between the participants. Now, the procedure is that each participant reports to the lab. So remember you've got a laboratory setting um, and they're greeted by a Dutch male experimenter. And he's dressed very formally in a suit like this picture shows. And he's very stern. So if you look at his face, he's very kind of like, he's not very uh, happy and cheery. He's very stern, straight faced um, when they meet him. So each participant was read a detailed transcript. Now a transcript is... Um, what the experiment is going to say word for word exactly and this is what it is the basic premise of it so it says the research we are doing is on sensory deprivation previous participants thought the experience was frightening we need college students who will take part at university oh sorry our university research committee is evaluating whether to approve our study because remember they've got to get ethical approval to be able to do a study it would help us if you could convince those students you named to take part uh, it would also help if you could help convince the research committee that our study is ethical so they will approve it. So the Stern experimenter dressed in a suit has basically read this transcript to them. And then the experimenter leaves the room for three minutes to allow the participants to reflect on what they've said. And then he says, we'll move to the next room. In fact, in there, in this one with the transcript, they're also saying things like what it's about, so what, this, what the actual experiment is about. So they're saying it's on sensory deprivation. Now, sensory deprivation is when you deprive your senses. So, for example, you might put someone in a room and it'll be completely pitch black and you might play them like loads of white noise or flash images in front of their face or just like just not have any input at all. Sensory deprivation, it, it's like really bad. Um, they used to use it as a torture technique for prisoners of war. So it has, like, it's very, very bad. Uh, it's very, very unethical what they're suggesting, really. Although saying that, it does say they thought the experience was frightening. It doesn't say, like, they thought it was horrendous and, they didn't, you know what I mean? It's not, it doesn't sound too extreme. This has got to be kind of moral still um, and not as bad as Milgram. So it's not. Maybe I've just hyped that up a bit and said it's a bit worse than what it actually is. But yes, yeah, so they've been left three minutes to reflect. And then the experiment says, we'll move to the next room. So he comes back. We'll move to the next room where you can fill in the statements for your friends and the form for the research committee. So the students have kind of, you know, recruited friends to take part in or put names down of their friends to take part in this, in this study. And then they're going to kind of approve this research committee form if they're being obedient and um, so they're basically you know people that they know are going to have to do this study and they've got to kind of put in the reports that they're going to write uh, you must be enthusiastic in writing your statement please use at least two of the following words exciting incredible great superb and please do not mention the negative effects of sensory deprivation so then they led to the second room where there was a computer, which is to write the report to the fellow students. So they've got to write this report basically saying that this study's all right and to include this exciting, incredible, great, superb words in there and not to mention any negative effects. So if they actually write the report and put these things in, they're being obedient. If they write the report and they put this in or they um, don't use these words or whatever, they're being disobedient. And if they actually put a tick in the research committee form saying that they think it's unethical, they've whistleblown. So the experimenter leaves the room for seven minutes for them to tick or not tick um, the ethics form. 
In fact, is the tick saying it's unethical? What did it say? So, I think the research violates that. Yeah, so by ticking it, it's saying it's unethical, which is what they've not been, they've been asked not to do that. They've been asked to, you know, not whistleblow. So that's whistleblowing if they fill that form in. If they write the report, they're being obedient, but only if they've got those words in. So exciting, incredible, great, superb, and not mentioning the negative effects. If they're disobedient, they either not writing the report or they write the report without these things in. Um, so then the experiment asks each participant to fill in the two personality tests. So once we've done the stuff to do with the obedience, disobedient, whistleblower, they then do the personality tests. So the whole thing lasts for about 40 minutes. So it's not that long, really. But then you might say that they get a bit bored towards the end, maybe. Uh, but they are different tests and stuff, so maybe they won't. And then at the end, they've been debriefed to ensure that they understood the nature of the study. So in this debrief, they've properly explained what's gone on. They've explained that actually they're not doing a study on sensory deprivation. Um, they just did that to see whether or not they'd obey, disobey or, or whistleblow. Um, and also what the personality tests were for. And this is so that they don't lose trust in future research. Because remember, these are students and they want them to take part in the research and things like that. Any comments that were made by the participants during this debrief were considered qualitative data. And the results then, so we've got results about predicting behaviour. So these are from the comparison students, uh, those 138 comparison students. So blow the whistle, as I said before, means filling out that research committee form. Obey means to write the statement, putting those words in, uh, support the sensory deprivation study, and disobey is obviously the opposite of that. So the comparison students predicted that for themselves, they would obey 3.6% of the time, but if they were to judge the adult, uh, sorry, average adult, they would say it was a lot higher at 18.8. And then we've got they're also disobeying and blowing the whistle. So in each of them, they think that they for themselves would blow the whistle more so than obey or disobey. Whereas in comparison to the average person, they say most of them would probably disobey but not whistle blow. Um, and not many of them would obey. So this is the prediction. This is before the study happened. Now this is the real participants in the study. So this is when the study actually happened. So what they found was that most people actually obeyed and went along with it. 14.1% disobeyed and only 9.4% of them blew the whistle. Now this goes with the hypothesis that Bocciaro said because he said, um, you know, people would be less likely to blow the whistle because it's confrontational. Will these results support that? We've got more people going along with it and obeying it, and not so many people disobeying. So I think on here we've got a graph. So what would you do? What would the average person do? So these are the comparison students, and then this is what was actually found. So you'll notice it's completely different. Completely different. The results of the personality tests, they found no significant differences between any of the three groups of participants, so the disobey, whistleblower, or bear, in terms of the hex core PIR. So on those per six personality factors, there was no differences. It's not like they had a specific personality and that's the reason why they obey, disobey, or whistleblow. So no differences there. And in terms of other individual differences, so to do with that kind of decomposed um, games task, what they found was that there was no significant differences in terms of gender. So males and females were no different. So even though we've got, you know, different, um, we've got a gender bias, haven't we? Because we've got more women than men. There was no gender differences anyway, so it shouldn't make any differences to the results. And then they've also got, you know, there was no differences between religious affiliation. If you're a Christian or if you followed Islam, made no difference. Um, so there's no differences there. Um, however, there was a significant trend with regard to faith. So, you know, a kind of belief in like an afterlife or a kind of a reality that's beyond what we can actually perceive. So belief in something, um, you know, in fate or, or in, a, in a God or anything like that. So faith itself um, showed that people who were whistleblowers tended to have more faith than obedient or disobedient participants. So this kind of goes along with that idea before of, you know, choosing that moral path because they believe in something more than what's in this world. So that now be explain why people whistleblow. You know, something to them their conscience is more important. Uh, something else is more important than what's in this world. 
this was so social orientation was also part of the decomposed games measure so each participant received a classification if they scored at least six out of the nine choices in one category so you can either be classed as pro-social individualistic or competitive so pro-social is where you know you love everybody else you like working with everybody you kind of it's a bit like at communism i guess you're going along with everybody um for the greater good all working as a group individualistic is where you're kind of working for yourself but you're not trying to harm anybody else or anything you're just working for yourself so maybe kind of a bit more like marxist no not marxist that's communism isn't it a bit more capitalist whereas competitive that's where you you know you'll step on anybody to get what you want so you don't care about anybody else you just do what you want to get so 28 participants did not score a minimum of six in any category, so they weren't classed as any of the three. Uh, three were competitive, though, which was not sufficient enough to be included in the analysis because there's only three of them, so that's kind of, you know, not even worth looking at. And they did use a non-parametric test, so a chi-squared analysis, of the 118 that were left. So, you know, if you take the 28 and the 3 out, you've got 118 left. And they found no pattern of pro-social or individualistic in the three types of participant. So either obey, disobey or whistleblow. So it didn't make any difference what kind of you know, personality they had in that sense. Um, it didn't affect whether they obeyed, disobeyed or whistleblowed. Now, the person who obeyed, so wrote the statement, and blew the whistle, so signed the research um, committee form, was classed as an anonymous whistleblower because they still wrote the report that they were asked to do, so they've obeyed in that sense, and then they put the form in kind of sneakily, so it's an anonymous whistleblower. Whereas the person who disobeyed, so they didn't write the statement, so they weren't writing on the computer the actual statement that it was okay, and blew the whistle, they were an open whistleblower. So they whistleblew, and it was quite obvious that they'd whistleblow because they refused to write the report. Now, only 14 participants actually blew the whistle, and of them, only five of them were open whistleblowers. So only five of them actually wanted to be known to be a whistleblower. So again, it's kind of, you know, people don't want that confrontation. Now, this group of five are too small for the final analysis, so it's not like you can actually say that there's something different about whistleblowers, because only five of them, it doesn't really, you know, they could just be different anywhere. So what they tended to do when they looked at the, the results of whistleblowers is they clubbed them all together. So they had all 14 of them in the analysis, rather than just looking at those five open ones. Because technically the open ones are the real whistleblowers, because they actually came out and said something. Whereas, you know, the anonymous ones kind of are a bit undercover. So to conclude then, we estimate that our behaviour is going to be one way, but actually it's completely different. So you say, yeah, yeah, I won't do that, I won't do that in the middle of the study, but actually you probably would. Same in the Bocciaro study, you'd probably go, ah, I just, dis I just whistleblow on that one, or disobey. But actually, you probably would obey and go along with it anyway, because of the situation that you're in. Um, the belief that people, you know, they think that they're better than the average person kind of makes us blind to the social pressures that we have around us you know we think oh it won't happen to us we're, we're kind of immune from it if that makes us vulnerable because we're not aware of how things in the situation are actually affecting us and that's quite worrying um, and that there's no significant differences in personality so this is a situational explanation for behaviour. You know, it's not like you can say there's a certain person that will obey, disobey or whistleblow. It's the situation that's affecting it of whether or not they, they will do it. But then having said that, they're not all behaving the same way. So there must be some explanation for why they're different. And this study doesn't really offer that. Um, we've got the reference there. And we've got some evaluation. Um, I think I've mentioned a lot of that stuff already. Um, I hope that was helpful. Um, if you've got any other further questions about it, then please let me know um, and I can help you with it.